1,174 feet off the quarter pole to the finish line here on Aqueduct's inner track. Home stretch, the longest home stretch on the Naira circuit. Welcome aboard. We are at the Big A. We're glad you've made it in time. Our first edition, guys, of the National Racing Report in February. It's Richard Migliori, Andy Serling, Jason Blewett. Look, a new month, and we get right to the three-year-olds off the bat running at Tampa in the Sam F. Davis. Yeah, an interesting race down there. I think we saw a pretty uh, talented horse, a horse that debuted at Aqueduct running down the Sam Davis. And we've got a lot of races this weekend, but that's probably the focus, Tampa. Well, I think so because we're talking three-year-olds. And anytime we start talking three-year-olds and we're not that far away from the Kentucky Derby anymore and we're starting to see some things come together, it's an exciting time of year. Yeah, we've got about 10 races total. We'll make a trip out to the West Coast, a big Saturday out at Santa Anita. But again, three consecutive stakes down at Tampa Bay Downs, and it begins with the three-year-olds in the uh, Sam F. Davis, the big favorite, Ocean Knight, second to last post. He's in the yellow cap outside. He's the main story of the race. Yeah, I, you know, sometimes I wonder at Tampa Bay, is there something about ground loss down there, Richie, that's not as bad as it is everywhere else? Because we do see horses out in the middle of the racetrack all the time. Well, yeah, all the time. And, I, and I, I've thought, often thought that, that it seems like horses can lose ground there and maybe it's just better outside it is kind of a deeper sandier surface and um, talking with Kieran McLaughlin after the race he said that he had told Ira just don't get him in trouble I think you're on the best horse even if you, you got a bad post you're gonna lose ground but at least give him an opportunity to make his run well I think he told him that after he rode good guy Nick or good pick Nick in the uh, second race and uh, he got in nothing but trouble in that race so maybe he said let's make sure that doesn't happen here I don't know if that trouble was really Ira's fault but he did keep him out of trouble here and he's all the way in the the outside and I think he covered about 60 more feet 61 more feet than the winner did or maybe the shortest the horse that stayed in the rail most of the way the winner was in about the two path much of the way it's a very good effort by Ocean Knight who had a nice debut a pretty good trip debut a little early trouble but overall a good trip but he paired up his 93 buyers and he did this with a wide trip stretching out in just a second start Richie. Well and I think that's the key to this uh, you know maybe visually it wasn't as impressive because of the margin of victory I mean to us it was because of the loss of ground but for a horse to go from a maiden race at six furlongs to a stake race, two turns, it was a lot to ask. And then the trip he had, he had every right to flatten out in here. And he put his head down and went and got the, the leader. I actually, at first, you thought he was going to do it. But actually, then it looked for a second like he might not get it done. And he does run, run down a long shot from Leal Stables. Of course, the stable that owned Barbaro and Divining Rod there, a horse who would run on dirt and then run on turf in his two starts. He ran very, very well at a big price in here. Ocean Knight, you know, here's the thing. It's not like it was 25 years ago, you know, we're so old. The horses, a lot of these horses are pretty lightly raced. Mm -hmm. I still think it's an impressive performance. Well, I think it's very impressive. And, and again, I think when he turned for home, he got lost a little bit. And then Irad hit him twice. And he really put his head down and ran to the horse, and he never hit him again. I like the fact that he didn't get beat up to do this, even though he only won by a neck. He was very, very confident in him. And talking with Kieran, he's going to run back in the Tampa Bay Derby. And if everything goes well... He'll run on April 4th, maybe the Bluegrass. He hasn't decided that yet. So he should have two more if he's going to make the Derby. Well, he's certainly got a couple of nice prospects in Frosted who ran second last week as well as Ocean Knight. And what I like so far, and we mentioned this last week, it's another Derby prep where we don't come out of it saying, I'm just disappointed in all the horses that ran and everybody that didn't run got flattered. We actually come out of it by saying there's another contender, and that contender is Ocean Knight. Yeah, and he is a contender. I mean, he's got a lot going against him. I mean, be, just be, being so lightly race breaking his maiden and jumping in, but he's obviously very talented. Talented. He jumped in the deep end of the pool and he passed this test. Caught by Curlin for Stone Street Stables. No Kentucky Derby points on the line in the Sam F. Davis. That makes his next race. And I guess they took the points away last year. I read the Sam F. Davis was a no points race. There was some sort of simulcast dispute between Tampa Bay and Churchill Downs, a network. And there's your answer with that. Blame. I know, you shake your head. It's a shame. Let's move on. Tampa Bay Derby next for Ocean Night. Well, we stay at Tampa Bay Downs for the Suncoast Stakes. These are three-year-old fillies, a modest purse of $50,000, and I think a big price winner in here who paid a good price, in fact, just under 19 to 1. A Tom Proctor horse has just broken its maid, and Rosemary Holmeister kept this horse in a different county. They were moving up front, but what's really impressive is the horse who was dueling for the lead, Huasco, who was 5 to 1 in this race, is in front right now, almost won the race. Include Betty took advantage of that fast pace, but you rarely see one of the horses in a duel hold on a close finish against a horse that comes from 20 plus back. Yeah, well, it, it kind of reminiscent of, of uh, include. It wasn't include. I was concerned that used to come from yeah. so far out of it. But uh, I think again, this is an example of you can lose ground at Tampa Bay and come down the middle of the track. In a nice, patient ride by Rosie uh, Homeister. You got to give a lot of credit to the, the runner-up Huasca. I mean, it looked like turning for home. She had put everybody away and put a stamp on it. No, I agree. She ran a terrific. 
terrific race near. I mean, that is a, a brutal beat. I, you know, everybody watches these races, and there's this inclination. <clears throat> Seahorses come from 10, 15, or more lengths back, and they make that big wide run. They go, oh, so impressive. I think you agree. I'm more impressed by the horse who was fighting out in the front end. The horse that she was dueling with was 90 to 1 and finished last, beaten over about 30 lengths or so in this race. Yeah, and, and that tells the story right there. She just completely got gutted with that speed duel, and this filly continued on. And, um, you know, Johnny Velasquez, if it was a mile, probably makes it. The mile and 40 got him, huh? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. <laughs> he got the extra 40 yards. And, you know, this three year old filly, and I don't think any of us are saying that Waska or include Betty belong in the top echelon of the division right now, but we're going to see a couple of horses. Uh, in bigger races, per se. But even though we'll see Take Charge Brandy win later in the show, that division is wide open. She'll do nothing to once again answer her critics and say, I'm better than you, th you think I am. Yeah, although I have a little different opinion, so it's going to be well, fun we'll to talk, talk about, about that. that. We'll have Take Charge, Take Charge Brandy's uh, successful three-year-old debut coming up right after the first break. But before we send it to the sidelines for that quick timeout, let's stay at Tampa Bay Downs and wrap up the action. In fact, on the west coast of Florida, bigger fillies or bigger, older, accomplished mares in the Endeavor Stakes will pick it up the far turn run, and I'll send it to you guys. Despite the race call, the winner, the, the horse who finishes first, the gray, does come through on the inside. Outside, about the three or four path, and the red hat is the horse who gets placed first, the favorite, Testa Rossi. These horses went the wire together. You could see on the pan, though, that the gray horse ducks out and interferes with Testa Rossi. Yeah, she, she ducks out uh, pretty abruptly. Um, you and I, I think, are going to disagree about this, and, and Johnny Velasquez never did hit her left-handed. I disagree. And, and, and you we'll think, show it. Well, no, we'll show it, but he never did hit her left-handed. He, he stayed with his right hand, and he never pointed her out, and when we watch the head-on, keep an eye on the way the grass blends in from the chute. I think she spotted something. Now, this is a filly I went back and watched has drifted out in the past. I want to show this in slow motion because Richie's saying a lot of nevers, and I don't agree with him. First of all, he's got a little urge there There's his with his left. Right hand. I know. Just keep. He's in the right hand, and she really hasn't even come out that much. So he's hitting her righty. He's hitting her righty. His left hand, though, he's a little aggressive with the left hand. That's a little bit of a trick that we've seen. He's hitting her lefty, but watch what happens here. Now he switches sticks. No, he never switched sticks. Okay, but he does go, the, he stops what sticking, he, he goes was, to urge with the left. What he did was, and if you could see where the grass blends in, I believe that she ducked out at that point, we spotting go back, Rick, the different Mitch. contour of the turf. And when he broke his left rein, his left hand away from the rain was to try to correct her because he felt her going to the right. He never pointed her head out. And I, listen, me and you agree about this. We don't like hurting. Right. I really, in my heart of hearts, don't believe he was hurting. I think this was all the horse. And when he does break his left hand off the rain, it's to try to correct her to keep her going straight, not to point her the other way. If you point a horse the other way, you got to break your right hand away from the rain. Okay, but he does stop hitting le right hand. Well, he does to try he to correct hitting... him because you don't you don't okay, steer a watch. horse with the whip. He, you, you're going to see right here. This is where she ducks out. Now you see he breaks his left hand to try uh, to correct him. I don't know. I, I hear you. You're a rider. You know better than I do what the guys are doing. I'm a little. Listen, di I think there's a split John, second. Johnny there she is goes so out. good. And, and he obviously he is, is not one of the big herders. So. No, but but he's subtle enough when he does do it that I will never believe in my life he would have pulled that move. That was an apprentice move, right? Well, and I think the Philly got away from it. It gets to the heart of my problem with the herding, and, and, and I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and say you're right in this case. You have much more experience, obviously, than I do. But um, we'll see guys try to herd, and sometimes the horse can get away from it. And that's when the same danger is going to happen. In my opinion, if stewards around the country don't start doing more about herding, it's creating a much more dangerous environment on the racetrack, and it shocks me on a daily basis that they let it go. I, I agree with you 100%, and I'll go one further. They got to crack down on every point of the race. Starts, yep. hurting, into turns. I see a lot of things that I consider shoddy and then becomes dangerous riding. And I'll tell you, they talk about things overseas. Guys would never do this over in Europe. You see guys getting disqualified yeah. and suspended for days. moving one path in different of situations. A lot of days right. overseas for this stuff. Well, two stakes wins on Saturday at Tampa Bay for Rod Ortiz Jr., who, by the way, was the one interfered with. The board Testa Rossi, the French bred for trainer Chad Brown, who's gotten off to a pretty good start in 2015. As D. Wayne Lucas, the coach, was hoping his Eclipse Award-winning Philly Take Charge Brandy would do at Oak Lawn Park. We'll have the races from Santa and a lot more here on the National Racing Report.
It's the National Racing Report. Some disagreements here in our clubhouse studio, but we all agree on the quality of this show, and we love Aqueduct as well. It's the MIG, Andy and Jason. Glad you're still with us on MSG+. Plus. 26 Eclipse Award champions and counting for D. Wayne Lucas, the latest of which, Take Charge Brandy. All eyes were on her. She's a big one-to-five favorite as we send it out to the action at Oak Lawn Park, and I will send it to you guys in a race I think a lot of people didn't feel going in would be that close. The Martha Washington, however, was a, it was a head decision. I, I'm never surprised if she's in, in, a, in a tough decision. Wayne Lucas has done an amazing job maximizing her and to have shipped her around the country as much as he had, and she's been as impressed, been able to win wherever he's taken or whatever she's been faced, but she's still taking advantage of less than stellar competition. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll agree with all that, and i got to be honest with you, I didn't like the way she looked at Oakland yesterday as much, just physically the way she was striding out. She didn't look as fluid to me, but I think they found this Phillies whole card, so I think there's positives and negatives. I think they found out she doesn't want to be hit with the whip, and she is a Philly that when she gets engaged, she finds again, and I think she did that yesterday. I think that Philly on the inside looked like it was going to pass her, oh, I agree. and then she spotted her and she went on a little bit. That's the positive. The negative is, is she just didn't look as good to me. No, I, I just, I, you know, I listen, you guys can say, you know, Wayne's squeezing a lemon dry. I'm not going to nail him for that. Right. I, I, you have to say that Wayne has done a great job with this Philly. Wayne is a lot of people's favorite whipping boy, and I'm just not joining that club. The guy has won too many races and had too many champions, as yep. you pointed out, to say that he doesn't know what he's doing. He has horses, and they respond. Some respond and some don't, but he's already won two great ones with this Philly. And he effectively earned an Eclipse Award for right. her because yeah. if she doesn't run or only run perhaps once after the Breeders' Cup uh, she juvenile win. win. She Let doesn't win. Lady Eli, Eli gets Philly it. Philly champion. Yep. And this Philly in anybody else's hands, she's not two-year-old Philly champion. Wayne Lucas made her a champion. I agree. And, you know, I, we're always complaining, and I complain a lot about guys that leave horses in their barn and don't run them. I can't complain when a guy like Wayne runs them. So I think it's terrific he's running her. He's done a great job with her. But I've read some things that he's considering the Arkansas Derby as a prep for the Derby. Please, Wayne. Don't run yeah, her in the Arkansas that, that, that She'll get her and hand it to her. Because the owner said uh, the Honey Bee, the Fantasy, and the Kentucky Oaks, and that was career start number nine Good. there for Take Charge Brandy. Well, maybe that's what they're doing. I had read that somewhere. It could have even been misinformation. I certainly hope that they're not planning on yeah, facing the boys. The yeah, yeah, you guys will be actually out at Santa Anita next weekend, in fact, as the uh, Jockey Club Tour on Fox Sports gets uh, underway, or Fox Sports 1 gets underway for 2015. You'll have the San Antonio to cover, and we'll, we'll discuss that in a few moments. But let's head out to Santa Anita ourselves here on the Racing Report, a blockbuster Saturday card and a real prelude to the action uh, this weekend as we look at the uh, first of the three stakes, beginning with the Las Virgenes. These are uh, three-year-old fillies, and uh, Bob Baffert's going to win here on the lead. The Las Virgenes, it's time for it to stop being a grade one, but we can have that conversation. We have more time another time. Uh, I was surprised, Richie, this horse cleared off the lead. Uh, I actually thought the other Bob Baffert at Maybelline, who never ran a step, would show more speed. She showed none and had nothing. A very nice ride on the runner-up from an outside post by Kent Sormo. They get down to the stretch there. Maybe these are improving horses, but they're not grade one horses. No, yeah. they're not grade ones. And this is a prep, and I think you and I agree, preps shouldn't be grade ones. These are the prep races for the grade ones. Um, this filly was game. It looked like she might be uh, run down by light, the city. And you brought it up. Kent Sormo has been riding it back in career form since he relocated to California. I agree, and I think it's one of the reasons that we talk about this a lot. Ken takes a lot of criticism. I think one of the reasons that we criticize him is we know how good he can be. And it's so disappointing when we see him riding, running, riding poorly because when he rides like this, he's as good a rider as there is in the country, and really, he's one of the greatest riders of all time. Yeah, absolutely. And you think about what he's able to do, like you said, when he's on, and that's why it is frustrating. You hate to see somebody waste their ability. I agree. Riding against him, did you feel that way even going back a few years ago, even as recent as when he was riding in New York on a regular basis? I'll be honest with you, he and I basically crossed paths at different junctures of our career. When he was really riding well out in California, I was on the East Coast in my prime. When he got here, I was already at the tail end of my career. You had a prime? And basically, well, yeah, it was, it was brief, but it, it was there. Um, but so I, I, we really didn't get to ride consistently enough for me to have a strong opinion about riding with him, but obviously proof's in the pudding. I see. I know what I see. This guy, when, when he when he rode well in his career, and, and he's doing it now, he's a great rider. And he'll be uh, getting aboard Texas Red on Sunday. Is that horse a uh, yeah, Breeders' Cup juvenile winner? Makes his uh, three-year-old debut, in fact. We're taping the show Super Bowl Sunday morning. Best of luck to a Texas Red. And uh, we stay at Santa Anita. The Palos Verdes is coming up next. Solid group of sprinters in this field. Very good group of sprinters. I thought one of the best things about that, there were two good things to take out of this race. One is Secret Circle, who's 
stunk the joint up as a heavy, heavy favorite coming back to California after running second the Scar Mile. He runs terrific in here. He was aggressively ridden. He pretty much attacked the whole way and really was the best horse. The horse who ends up winning is fourth right now, Conquest Two Step. Yes, he gets a perfect trip, and maybe he was second best, but he was 70 to 1 when second, a close second, Richie, to shared belief in the Malibu. And I felt that that might have suggested that that was a pretty weak race. Well, I think he legitimized it here. Yeah, well, and, and he absolutely showed that that was no fluke, that he, he ran a, a good race that day and ran a very good race this day. I can't get past the fact that Secret Circle was the best horse in this race. And oh. they, now they added blinkers again. He had blinkers on, they had taken them off. So obviously they, they wanted to change some stuff up and get him interested, but the same thing that maybe got him interested might have hurt him because he was too engaged. Yeah, well, I don't. The question is, Richie, what could. I mean, you, you look back and you say. Yeah, maybe he could have rated him a little bit more, but maybe you just got to dance a little bit with the girl that brought you there. Well, absolutely, and they put the blinkers on to make him more aggressive. Now he is more aggressive. Now you want to take it away right. from him. And, so. and uh, in between a bit of a rock and a hard place for Martin Garcia, I mean, the horse he was uh, chasing, distinct of passions and raging foreman, had beaten him in the midnight loop. And he drowned him and beaten him by seven lengths in this race, so you're right. Or he beat him by six lengths or five and change. But uh, I agree. I mean, he you have to attack distinct of passion. You're right. He can't just let him get away because he he sits back and lets him go. Him. He may not be able to pass him. Now, as it turns out, he probably would have, but you don't know that going in. No, you, you don't know that going in. And, and again, you've put the blinkers on to create something within the horse. You've created it, and it's the same thing, that, like you said. It got you there, but it might have cost you ultimately. And let's give Joe Talamos some, some love here. It was his, he, one of his four wins yesterday, and he's been riding lights out, and he gave this horse an absolutely perfect trip. No, he did. He rode this horse perfectly, and Mark Cassie has clearly improved him, and he's just a different horse than he was. We'll see what happens. Shared belief against California Chrome. We're out in California next week. I do think that, I don't think shared belief needs to be given any more accolades, but I do think for people like myself that were concerned about the Malibu, I think this gives it more of a boost. You know, I, I would agree with all that, absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing about shared belief now going forward to the San Antonio, his works are a lot different. It looks like he's training with a lot more purpose where almost maybe they were using the Malibu to springboard to better things. Well, hopefully he'll have to have his best race sure. because California Chrome has a tactical advantage on him in what could be a relatively small field out there. It's going to be one heck of a race. Indeed it is. We'll look forward to you guys on Fox Sports 1 next uh, Saturday as we get on the, the, uh, the Conquest 2-step or off Conquest 2-step. And Mark Cassie, we've seen him uh, strengthen his position out in Southern California. That was evident going into uh, Saturday's Arcadia Stakes as he ran both the Greza Approval, who has a no-cover three to four wide trip, and Kagan, who did some nice things last year. Yeah, Kagan had nothing really here with a very good trip. I thought Zah Approval ran extraordinarily well when you consider the dynamics of the race and the wide trip he had, but this was a great ride by Gary Stevens. He put Avanzer in the game with purpose from the start. The pace was very fair in here, but he had horse under him, and he knew what he was doing. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing he does so well when he has the horse in that position, how to kind of milk out that, dole out that speed. And uh, the other thing, too, that's more subtle, and, and as an ex-rider, I look at, he had that horse so balanced turning for home. You know, you see a lot of times the guy will turn for home and they go all in. He still had that horse just in a perfect frame to really maximize his stride. And it's, it's subtle. And it's not easy to do, especially when you're into the stretch and big money's on Well, that went actually for Gary Stevens aboard Avanzar. He brought his North America total to a 4,999. I was reading that on Twitter from Steve Anderson from right. the Day of Racing Forum, and he said he's won many races overseas. How many races did Gary win outside this country? Well, I, I mean, like Dubai America. World Cup is one but that I mean, comes to mind. But I mean, he said it like well, he there did, were a few hundred. He did, he did ride for Sir Michael Stout. No, I, I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if it was 100. Okay. I don't think it would be. It's probably right around that mark, but he did spend a season, and he also rode in Hong Kong. So, you know, those totals don't right. count. Yeah, it's probably got to be over 100. All right. All right, fair enough. Bob Benzari, Tom sure. Proctor, good weekend good for race. him. And let's give this uh, gelding by Grand Rewards some credit. Took him a while to get through the uh, the uh, not winners of two allowance condition. Was struggling in that condition last winter down at Tampa Bay Downs, but he's improved big time. And I'd like to see some of these horses not be afraid of Wise Dan. When they run a big race at Keeneland, a grade one, Run Avanzar down there if he's doing well. It's no disgrace to lose to Wise Dan. I think too many people are afraid to run in spots. This horse deserves a chance. We'll see what he does in the big race in a month, but he's okay. I think he's got the right trainer with Tom Proctor. He's not afraid of taking shots, and he knows when his horses get good. And he's a trainer that his horses develop. Like you said, Tampa Bay last year, but he yep. probably had a long-range plan to get this horse where he is now. I hope so. And he's got that string out in Southern Cali and Tampa Bay Downs as well as we wrap up the second segment with one of the greats, H. Allen Jerkins, the giant killer, the 
Chief. Well, his namesake on display Saturday at Gulfstream Park. A two-mile turf race. They went around a few times, and Todd Pletcher gets the money with Unitarian, who's about to pounce three to four wide. Yeah, I actually don't know if a lot of people saw this in the condition book. They said they were going to keep going around the track until Todd Pletcher won. <laughs> That's funny. But me, a uh, Unitarian, actually, out of the four turns, he saved ground on three of them. And what do we always talk about? <laughs> if you're going to lose ground like, when you make your run, save as much ground early. Well, Javier Castellano, as always, executed the perfect trip. Yeah, he got a perfect trip, and he helped. He got the good post. I thought Edgar, I was surprised to see reflecting on the front end, who I thought was a very juicy price at 7-2. to two. Uh, He did a good job nursing him along. He yeah. ultimately wasn't good enough to win that race. Tattenham had a... About a five-wide trip around every turn. I think he covered 101 more feet than the winner in and this And moved race. aggressively. It's not only that he was out there four to five wide down the backstretch the second time, really made a bid. Richard Migliori would have moved him aggressively, and he would have saved ground every turn in the front end. He might have run sixth anyway, but you would have been in front, and you would have been saving well, ground. Well, I think he got keen on him, so that's why he got aggressive. But if he gets aggressive, you know what? Drop his head. Let him open up two or three lengths. Drop to the fence. I guarantee you he'll come back, and you're going to have a softer trip than you got. I understood what he was trying to do, keep a horse out to try to get him to settle. It wasn't working, and you're losing ground. <laughs> yeah. And you looked ridiculous yeah, out right. there. It really was. But once again, Todd Pletcher and Javier got it done. Well, Todd, to be fair, has maximized the talent and, uh, and overall ability with Unitarian, who, regarding middle-distance turf runners, might not be towards the cream of the crop, but he can run all day, and Todd's picked out the right spot. He's got to be the uh, future book favorite for the Belmont Gold Cup, two miles on the grass. Well, yeah, no, that's <laughs> got to be, uh, be his big race he's pointing for. Well, we look forward to getting uh, across town to Belmont Park, but we still have some unfinished business here on MSG Plus. We come home to the Big A and some solid New York bred three year old sprinters in action in the Regal Park. Welcome back. National Racing Report. We're just passing the eight ball on this show. And, of course, we look forward to another racing week here at the Big A. Dark Monday and Tuesday. Back at it this coming Wednesday. An eight race card with the first race post of 120. And keep that in mind. Weekdays for the current time being at Aqueduct. We'll get things underway at 120. Weekends with the nine race cards will start at 1245. It's the Big. It's Annie. It's Jason. Glad you're still with us. And I'll tell you guys, inner track, all joking aside, very extensive stakes programs for the three-year-olds, and I think we saw that last weekend. No, I agree. We've got some nice New York bread races coming up here. We've got the Rigo Park. We're going to show on this show. We're running the Franklin Square on Sunday. Hopefully, we can bring that back and show it on the show next week. That came up as a good race, and you're right. There's a lot of stuff going on here. The Withers next week, El Kabir. Yeah, and, and again, I just like that we have such a comprehensive uh, series of races. Again, it kind of got disjointed for a while, and, but now with the Withers, the Jerome, or Jerome, the Withers, Gotham, and Wood Memorial one month apart, you can train a horse and run a horse up to the derby. Yep, absolutely. You're 1 to 20 to see the Withers and have a recap on the Withers or of the Withers on this show uh, next week. But let's get to uh, a field that that had some promise within in, uh, in Friday's Rigo Park Stakes. Rescheduled from last weekend. It went as the featured seventh race. And Christoph Kamat I didn't have a daydreamer here. Saratoga Dreamer, all business beneath the Rod Ortiz. Yeah, no, uh, this is a horse that took to the dirt very, very well for this race, and uh, Christophe was right in shipping him up here. The favorite in here, uh, break, break, no, I'm sorry, our deficit off, he broke a little slowly. He was dreadful. He, he was. You could see he was off the bridle early. Kendrick Comus was trying to keep him in position, and Kendrick's a good race rider. I'm sure he wanted to get up next to Saratoga Dreamer and make sure he can limit his options. He just didn't have any horse to do so. No, he didn't, and you know, I, 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 this horse, Regal Minister is a nice horse, but he was fortunate when chasing Bubbles, who was probably the speed, stumbled so badly at the start, he basically was eliminated from the race, so he was able to set a very moderate pace. Oscar Gomez riding the horse, breaking the fever on the outside, eventually finishes fourth. This is a horse that Richie and I are on the same page on. This horse, he's a bad actor. He threw him before the start. Oscar, I don't love, or um, uh, Gomez, I don't love the way he's handling the horse. I do think he has talent, Richie. I think he's very talented, but he is obviously a hard-headed horse. Yeah. He's difficult about a lot of things. And the, the winner was very cantankerous behind the gate. He was tough to load, and I know I spoke with Christoph Comont right after the race, and he was saying he was disappointed because they worked so much with him in the mornings, but then he did everything right once the gates opened. Well, once again, of course, overcame Christoph's training. I think that's clear, and that's what he was really trying to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> An 80 buyer, by the way, for this New York bred son of elusive quality with E. Rod Ortiz Jr. riding, and I think, or at least I was reminded on Friday, you got a very sharp guy like Christoph Kamant shipping this horse, taking the time to ship this New York bread up from Florida to New York. 
there was a reason behind it. Yeah. He, well, he had said he had trained so brilliantly on the dirt, you know, down in Florida that he was looking for a race at Gulfstream. And then he said, wait, I got this race I can ship him up to New York for. The horse is now back in Florida. So he, this is a New York bred that's a snowbird. Well, I mean, they're also, we don't know if there are any really any spots for him over the next month or so for him to run up here because he's going to need a New York red stake. I mean, obviously, Christophe could look and think, should I take a shot at the Bay Shore? But in all honesty, because we'll look at the next horse who's right. likely to be in the Bay Shore, yeah. this horse is not going to be competitive in the Bay Shore. So he'll look at New York red stake races, and there just might not be a spot for a while. Yeah, pretty neat horse, though, to be able to win on turf and now yeah. dirt. And, you know, uh, he's a better dirt horse than his turf horse. Yeah. He ran better in this race because he was able to overcome. Even though he had some natural speed to put him in the game, he's not really a speed-type horse. And I thought his debut win at Saratoga, he took advantage of a race that collapsed against a field that was not that good. This was a much better effort. Yeah, and the fact that he took the kickback and everything, something he never experienced before. Wood Day will be here before you know it. It'll be Wood Week before you know it with Larry Colmas calling upstairs. But speaking of last year's Wood card in the Bay Shore, if my memory is correct, Coup de Grasse won that spot or won that race for Chad Brown. And Chad's got a pretty good gelding by Majestic Perfection who won the Frank Whiteley last week by a lot at Laurel. Well, we saw this horse win, win a race here earlier to meet and get a 97 buyer and look impressive. And he's riding him a little bit now to get away from the field. Uh, but he got a 91 buyer. He buried the field. They went seven furlongs. I know there's some temptation to stretch him out. They said the miracle would in a couple weeks in a mile. They could be silly and try the Gotham with him. I hope they keep him sprinting. This is a very good sprinter. This is a very good sprinter, and he's got that turn of foot. When they have that turn of foot, because you saw when Kendrick asked him turning for home, he was able to sprint away. They don't generally stretch out successfully because they have too much brilliance and less stamina. And I like that we had a race named for Alan Jerkins and now one for Frank Whiteley, two of my favorite trainers of all time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Two of the, uh, the all-time greats. Yeah, two gems for sure. As we uh, wrap up the show, wish you guys a safe flight out to the West Coast. And how excited are you, A, to get the, uh, the new uh, series off the ground on Fox Sports 1, but B, just to be there to see California Chrome and Cher Belief face each other? And I'll be with Richie, and he'll be able to come for me on the plane because I get nervous flying. No, we're very fortunate. <laughs> lucky to go out there and I I know we're both thrilled to be out there yeah it's, it's great we are very fortunate to be able to go out and see these great horses compete live well we'll have those horses for you next week on the National Racing Report we say goodbye and good night from the big A and we'll see you next time right here on MSG plus